Hey, this is John Bokenkamp. Welcome to the Blacklist Exposed on Golden Spiral Media. Happy Holidays 2018 to one and all. This is the award-winning Blacklist Exposed podcast. I am Agent Troy Heinrichs. Glad to be back for Season 6. And I am Agent Aaron Peterson, and we are back in black. Yeah, we're in for another exciting season of The Blacklist. Pretty blessed this episode, though, right? This is the first one back since the finale. Is that the last one we did? No, we talked to Court Hessler, the stunt coordinator for the Emmy nomination. You know, I'm not absent-minded. I was just lining that up so you could uh, knock that self-promotion across the plate. Right out of the park. Just like, oh, it's like we're almost back to like normal in like the first episode already. You know what? I don't understand. You know, we do the, the Westworld podcast, too, just the two of us. But whenever we do that, they don't like us together that much. They do not. They do not. <laughs> it's the same banter, same back and forth. But for whatever reason, you guys appreciate it more. So we love doing this show more than that one. And because you appreciate us, we are going to have a fun time tonight because the man himself, Mr. John Bokenkamp, is in the house to give us all the goods on season six because they probably have like 100 in the can by now. So this will allow us to... Go ahead and get some spoilers, potentially, before the big premiere on January 3rd. Yeah, and I'm going to preface the interview. He doesn't say anything about it in the interview. I'm not ruining anything in the interview. But if you have not seen the Blacklist Season 6 trailer yet, don't. (laughs) Just go on and do something else. I would rather you just hit this fresh and new and enjoy it for everything that happens. There's a lot of cool things that that I think are coming this season. I don't want you to see any of it. I'm doing this for your own good. You're going to be tempted. You're feeling it. Just like that Avengers Endgame trailer hits, and you're like, I want to see it all. You don't. Just just hold tight. January is right around the corner, literally. It's in a few days. Just be patient and wait it out. It sounds like by you telling me not to watch the trailer that you've seen potentially the first episode or two. I'm not saying anything. I'm saying don't watch the trailer. That's all I'm saying do yourself a favor. Do it, it does the body good. Avoid the trailer. I always try to avoid every promo of the black of any show actually at the end, so I don't watch the next one. But just just go in blind. I think you're going to enjoy it a lot more, and you're going to get a lot more out of John's conversation here just by going in blind. He's going to talk about some pretty cool stuff too. I'm pretty excited about this. Well, if you're new to the show, normally about this part of the podcast, before we get into the, the big topic of the week, we do a little profiling question. And so those will be returning when we kick off with the premiere episode in a few weeks. So the profiling question for our next episode is going to be, what do you expect to see in season six? Give us your best theories out of the gate. Twins, uncles, moms, fathers, whatever you want it to be. Just give us your best theory. Heck, maybe even wrestler has a drinking problem again. I don't know. But we just want to know what you think Season 6 is all about. Let us know your profiling question. Feedback at goldenspiralmedia.com. Or, of course, you can just reach out to us on Twitter. I am at Troy Heinrichs. He's at Aaron Smirks. And, of course, at the Blacklist GSM is where you want to be for the tweet party on January 3rd and 4th. And I've got two very important questions I would like people. Hit us up on Twitter and let us know what you think. Number one, do you think Aram and Samar will end up getting married this season? Is it possible? We're going to get a blacklist wedding, maybe a little less bombastic as the last one. And number two, how far by centimeters will wrestlers' hair move this season? In total, throughout 22 episodes, which we're getting, how far is it going to move? I want to know. What do you think? What's your guesstimate? Let's go. Would not be a blacklist exposed podcast without a wrestler hair comment. It's a thing. I can't. I don't know what to tell you. Well, should we get John in here and get this thing going for him? I'm sure they're sick of hearing us, so yes, let's get him in here. Here's John Camp on The Blacklist Exposed. Well, hey, John, welcome back. Good to hear from you. Season six, it seems like it's been forever, but we're super excited. It's right around the corner. Glad to have you. Glad to be here. Glad to still be on the air, swinging. John, in years past, you have known that you were going to get renewed way ahead of time whether it be in September, October, November, January, February, whenever it was. And this past year, it seemed to me that it was down to the wire. 
what is that what happened? Can you can you kind of elaborate on exactly how the renewal process went this this past season? Because it seemed very up in the air. Everybody was kind of on pins and needles. We didn't know what was going to happen. Did you already know? Or well, not really. It, it, it uh, in fact, this was as close as it has, has been. I'm usually the last person who knows anything. So um, really, yeah, it, it's it's bananas. It's it's. Um, I don't know. I think the, the negotiations each year, I think with all shows, become more and more intense. I think the, uh, you know, the networks like to own more of a piece of the show. And so it's, you know, there's, there's different things that they're arguing about and wrestling over regarding financial positions and stuff. So it's, it's, I think it's less just about their schedules and more about sort of their business plan as a whole and what they're going to pick up. And it is, I'm always surprised at uh, how late it, it goes down. Even when we were picked up in the first season, it was very late. This year, I actually just, I turned off the computer. I turned off my phone for two days and just went to Denver with my wife and went to dinner and was like, I can't take it. I can't. I'll turn <laughs> on the phone later and figure it out. But I was really proud of myself for having some restraint and just being like, all right. Because I, I found myself like, re, I'm like waiting to read about it on deadline to see, you know, are we coming back or not? And I think we, we had gone into... um NBC, John Eisendrath and I had, had made a really, I think, really compelling case about where the show's going and, and, and why we need to come back. And um, I felt good about it. But, you know, every minute that passes and you're hearing all these other shows that are being picked up, it's, it's always nerve wracking. You know, anybody who says it's not is, is lying to you. So it's, uh, it's torture. Ah, so you get to feel what it's like to be a fan, kind of, in a way. <laughs> Exactly. I'm telling you, the fans know about when I do. Yeah, it is always a nail biter. And it's, it's the way it's that way for everyone. I mean, it's that, you know, the other friends who I know are people who have worked on the show, have gone on and done their own shows and so forth. It's, it's always not super healthy to be sitting on the sidelines watching and waiting. So but we're, we're both lucky and fortunate and super excited to be back and really, really pumped about this season. It's going to be really great. All right. Well, speaking of biggest question and I know you like to waver. You love to waver and like, eh, waffle a little bit. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know, Aaron. Why don't you watch the show and you'll find out? But would you would you be willing to say in certainty that, yes, 100%, the Raymond Reddington we are watching, James Spader, is not the Raymond Reddington we think? I don't know. You gotta, you gotta oh, you watch suck. the show. And uh, <laughs> no, uh, look. Yeah, I will say that. Yes, the the guy who we have been watching, the 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 character that James Spader has been portraying for the past five years, in fact, is not the original Raymond Reddington, and is not the uh, naval officer you know that was known by the U.S. government thirty some years ago, and is in fact uh, an imposter, which I think you guys called. A while ago, if I remember my yeah, my no listening habits, it was definitely something that's been on your radar for a while. To be fair, I think everybody just throws a lot of things at the wall, and that's just one that stuck. Well, that was our that was our first theory coming out of the gate. It was the the Scooby theory because we thought mm-hmm. we thought wouldn't it be funny if he pulls off the mask and it's Kiefer Sutherland because you guys were trying to <laughs> cast Kiefer when it was oh, like fantastic. originally coming yeah. out, yeah. Yeah, no, it, that is the story. Um, I think uh, James has said in something I saw in the press recently that um, you know this guy is still the person we have been watching for the past five years. His, his stories, his adventures, his sort of all the, you know, the, the things that are funny about him, the things that are dangerous about him. Those are all still Raymond Reddington that we have come to know and love. The, the thing that James said that I liked was he, he said that the, the real Raymond Reddington, the guy that, you know, from all those years ago, they never would have made a TV show about him. I thought that was I thought that was a, a good line, <laughs> and true. That guy was probably much more boring, and you know he was a pencil pusher in the navy. You know, and uh, this guy is definitely unique and mysterious. And the questions uh, are, there are, there are still many about him. What did you guys decide to do in the room then, to, in order to keep it straight? Because as the fans are talking about theories, they're saying, "Okay, it's Raymond Reddington." Okay, it's not Raymond Reddington. So are we calling Raymond Reddington is the guy that is the father of Liz? That's in the bag of bones and then we're calling this guy just red going forward is that how you guys are keeping it straight in the room well there's no there to, to me there he's he's just raymond reddington yeah you know i mean he it is the the truth it's like darth vader is just darth vader right you don't really call it well is he anakin or is he darth vader? he's just darth vader you know so <laughs> he 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 uh, vader is raymond reddington and you know we we tried to lay out 
you know, a lot of um, touchstones along the way, there, there, whether it's him saying in episode nine of the first season, you know, when she asks, are you my father? And he hesitates and says no, or any number of, of clues along the way, you know, therapy has helped me become an entirely different person. You know, he has said, and, and there are a number of those sort of touchstones um, that I feel like we as a room feel like are playing fair with the audience and uh, the track, if you go back and, and really drill down on them, but yeah, it's uh, it's been a long process to get to this point. And you can imagine if we weren't picked up, how, how nuts it would have made me. I'm like, James, if we don't come back, what do we, are we going to do like the, you know, the puppet show of, of <laughs> what would have been the ending of this, of this show? Like, what are we going to tell people? You know? Yeah. It's exciting to be on, really even footing really with not completely even footing, but even footing with the audience in really letting everyone in on a big truth about the show. So, so to further confirm, you would also say that James Bader, Red Reddington, as we know him is not Liz's father. Would you go on the record and say that that's definitive? Raymond Reddington, as we know him is not Liz's father. You're trying to trap me. here. I can feel this. I got to <laughs> repeat just, myself. I got to uh, repeat this question back. Uh, well, uh, well uh, I'll answer it in the affirmative. Yes, Raymond Reddington is Elizabeth King's father, but the character that James Spader has been playing for five years is not Raymond Reddington. Bam! That's that answers, it clarifies. It's exactly all I wanted. I'm good. Interview's over. We can we can hang it up. All right. Good. <laughs> Done. Good night, guys. Which is what I appreciate because if you look back at the at the clues, people are like, "Oh, well, this doesn't make sense." And they're trying to piece it together at the end of last season. You guys gave the answer in the premiere. Of course, I'm a criminal. Criminals are notorious liars. Everything about me is a lie. From there, it's imposter theory from day one. Yeah, that's another one of those touchstones. That's right. That's one of those things that's along the way is, he said, a father uh, who was a career criminal, a mother who died of weakness and shame. Well, the father, it's a half truth, I guess. And a mother who died of weakness and shame, the suicide walking into the water. So there there are, yes, uh, truths that have been very uh, laid into the mythology from a very early point. And as fans, I think we appreciate that specifically, John, because we could go back and you can trace all those steps back to this reveal at the end of season five and say, look, they've had this planned all along. There's a lot of shows that don't do that or try to retcon stuff. And I think you guys have been very truthful all along, which super appreciative. Well, it has been a torture at times to <laughs> try to, to do that. And, and you know what? We've got uh, a number of people who are on the show or who have been on the show that I am sure at some point I'm going to call by the time we get to the end of this and say, okay, remind me, walk me through this very, very clearly. Because it's a sprawling, it, but at this point, you know, I mean, six years, it's a sprawling mythology. And we work very hard to play fair and uh, yes at times it feels like it's a complete lie we've completely broken the mythology that doesn't make any sense there's no way that that could be you know you're contradicting yourself in something that you said uh, a season ago but as as the show progresses and as uh, i hope the sort of truth bears out that um you know ultimately sometimes these contradictions are not contradictions at all, but, but align and, and support the same sort of underlying mythology. How do you feel about how you guys have, have kind of unraveled it? Do you, do you feel good about the, how you've progressed to the seasons, how you've kind of layered it out and you've gotten to this point? I mean, take us, take us through, I guess, as fans a little bit. How do you know when to unpack each step that you've done to get to this point? Um, I think we would judge us more over the life of the series than like a specific episode or episodes. I think at times we do a better job than others. I, I'm sure that at times it's, it's felt like we're stalling, you know, or that we haven't pushed the story ahead fast enough. It's, it really is the hardest thing to do. You know, you, you, you really don't know how long you're going to be on. You don't know if you're, you know, living to fight another day. And so you burn through the mythology and tell the story quickly and make sure you, you, you have an opportunity to really, you know, stick the landing. Or do you, you know, sort of bide your time? It's been really hard for me to slow down. It's been very difficult to reveal the story in a, not in an organic way, but in a way that sort of, I, my instinct is to rush it. I, I, I thought that the end of season one was that we find that the red's not red. And that would have been horrible. Uh, we we would have been 
I mean, it'd be terrible. We'd be done, you know. But that it's very difficult, and and it is something that we struggle with. And I think more of the times than not, we do a good job of balancing a uh, a serialized story with the case of the week and personal stories. But I'm sure there's times where we could do better. It's just you you really don't know until it's done, and it's a little bit of a learning curve. I want to talk to you a little bit about Liz's arc because, and and I'll be perfectly honest, I mean, year after year, people rave and rave about James Spader's performance, rightfully so. He's done a fantastic job. He's a a historic actor, classic actor, great actor. I, I really believe Megan Boone last season, you guys gave her a lot to play with a lot of dimensions, a lot of layers, a lot of depth. And she rose to the occasion. How did, how did you feel about taking Liz on that journey and Megan coming into her own in that respect? I mean, because I really felt like she was being talked about in the same circles as, as Spader for, for the first time in the show's arc. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I, I think that Megan has to take nothing away from where she began. No, not at all. She has, she has grown so much, you know, and, and she's very, she, I think she's become incredibly natural. I think her instincts are very good. I think that, Yes, we have ultimately maybe given her better storylines, a little more um, textured or complex storylines. She's in a deficit. Her, anybody who would play that character is in a deficit because she is the audience's, she's a POV character, right? Everything that we, we, the way we sort of digest the show comes ultimately through her. And she started as a, you know, first day on the job, newbie FBI agent. And at times she is behind, you know, at times red, you know, we see him ahead and that's part of baked into the DNA of the show that he's very clever and he's always two steps ahead. And so it puts her and the FBI at times in, uh, you know, in a, in a position where it's difficult. And I think that we worked really hard last season to not only put her on even footing, but to really, I don't know, just try to, to develop her character and, 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 drill down on, again, her perspective. And I think in looking ahead this season, we double down on that. The show is evolving. The show is changing. And Red is no longer, even though we understand almost less than we ever have about him, he is no longer just this mysterious character who walks into the room and we don't know anything about him. We know a lot about him. It's a different sort of balancing act of character and and story and mythology and i think that as we as we look ahead in terms of uh, where we go this season if you like that sort of energy uh and color that megan was able to play last season at least from a writing perspective there's more of that this season she's uh, crushing it still but but that sort of storytelling uh where she's in the driver's seat continues well into season six and is a, a good engine for our 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 series because for the first time, she's now at the head of the class. She's got one up on yeah. Raymond Reddington, Phil Red, whatever you want to call him. How difficult is it for you now to balance the writing for season six so that the audience knows, hey, remember, Liz already knows the answer, but yet she's got to have these interesting conversations and dialect with James Spader's character in order to keep Raymond in the dark. So how hard is that for you to say, okay, what do we do in this scene to put the language in such a way that it doesn't tip right off, but at the same time, not lose the audience going like, Hey, I'm confused at what's going on here. I think that's actually what's one of my favorite parts about this coming season is that. So she knows this truth about Reddington. She is, she is a leaps and bounds ahead of him in terms of knowing a, a deep truth. And he has no clue that she knows. And so she is, acting uh or she's almost acting in scenes with him right liz is acting in scenes as if you're my father i have come to care about you you're this great guy you you have given so much for me and tried to protect me and yet at the same time none of that's true and she's working this mystery you know (laughs) she's working this sort of puzzle to figure out who he really is so juggling those two perspectives i think is really interesting and then of course you're also wondering what does Red know? How much does Red know? Is, is he catching up? Does he know what she knows? At, at what point will he figure that out? Will he figure that out? So I think it, it sort of has given us a really renewed sense of um, 
mystery in a great organic way that their story is pushing forward into new territory. It's not just great. Here's a new case. Who are we going to go catch this week? There, she's really vibing this guy out and, and is in the driver's seat in a, in a way that I think is going to be fun for people to watch. So what can you tease us about season six that, I mean, what, what can you tell us about it? I mean, obviously we don't know anything yet. It hasn't aired. It's coming up really close at the time we're talking to you. What, what can people expect? What should they look forward to? Is there anything they should keep an eye on? Well, now I'm reticent to even bring up this NBC promo of what they give away. <laughs> uh, what, Aaron, you never watch promos and you watch this. Man, I'm telling you, and I actually give a forewarning before, uh, before the episode, tell people just don't watch the trailer. And it's nothing against, you know, the wonderful team at NBC. It's just, I don't watch promos. I never watch promos. I watched this one because everybody was talking about it. And then I watched it. And I'm like, ah! Why? I, okay, so here I'm gonna I'm gonna give a spoiler, and I'm gonna give this away, right? And I don't think it's a it's the biggest secret, but if you don't want to know, you got to skip ahead. I don't know, uh, ninety seconds, something like that. Make okay. it two minutes. Red is captured. Red goes to jail, right? Red is arrested, and it feels like it is the most. It's a, it's a great story. It feels like it's a story that how could this not have happened yet, right? We're six seasons in. We've told so many stories about who he is, where he comes from, how he's connected to these people on this task force. And yet here's this fresh, really new story about what would happen if the world's most wanted was captured and thrown into prison. And when that happens, who are his allies? Who's going to leave him? Who's going to join him? How is he going to survive? How does he navigate the system? It is a, a really different take on our show that I think is really refreshing. In that sense, I'm really excited about it. I'm a little bummed that it kind of comes out in the promos. Uh, but, you know, you got to give to get, I guess. And that's advertising. And But I, but I, I am really excited about that, that story and the, the new people that it allows us to meet. And the, uh, the sort of unusual adventures it's going to take us on. It, it, it's the same show, but in a, I want to say, in a, in a completely different way. So before we get to new people, what about old people? We got Smokey last year introduced with the Carnies. <laughs> Are we going to get more, <laughs> really liked him. more Smokey Putnam at all? I liked him a lot. For sure. We've got Smokey. Uh, it takes a while to get back to Smokey, but we definitely have Smokey. We've got Glenn. We've got Brimley. It's funny, after five, six years, uh, you know, whether it's the, the man in the gray flannel suit, uh, Mr. Mr. Gray or, um, or Mr. Kaplan or others who are close to Red, we've lost some family members along the way. But there's still a great family tree that we pull from. And like I say, there's new characters. There's uh, Vontae Jones is a character we're going to get to know. Um, there's, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to spoil it, but there are, there are a number of, uh, new characters who are going to enter the orbit of the show and have both good and negative impacts on on Reddington. Hey, last season you introduced the concept of Samar and Aram getting married, which was, I thought, really fascinating because I didn't think it would be that quick. I mean, you, you had the time jump, so that helped, but I still didn't think it would be that quick. What made you decide to, to take that leap? Because this show, you know, it, it, these relationships don't always go so well, so we're all really nervous for one of those two now. Yeah, right. Well, uh, we we don't have a great history with weddings, right? Like they typically don't. They they haven't always panned out really well. Mm. Um, but that said, look, they're they're um, you know I talk a lot about how we have a real plan and how we sort of have always from day one known where the show is going. The truth is there are big sort of uh, expansive areas of the show where the show finds itself and where you don't know when you sort of start writing to, to storylines. And I remember there, it was uh, the front was, I believe, the episode where Aram took Samar's hand in the hospital room. She had been uh, ill and he took her hand and the music and the moment, it just was like, oh my God, those two, that's a thing. And it wasn't something we felt we had to rush into, obviously, after three years, but it's sort of this slow simmering thing that was interesting to play with. And it felt like it was just a tease if we didn't embrace it a little more. And I thought it was such a sweet proposal. John Eisendrath wrote that moment where 
you know, he's, he's proposing and at last plays. It just felt like it was the right thing to do. And it's going to be a great story this year, obviously complicated. It's not just, you know, roses and bubble baths. It's, uh, it's complicated and has issues, real issues that will ultimately affect the series. It just felt like we had to, we had to lean into that story. It was, it was too, they're, they're too good together to not tell that story. So does that mean that we might see some Mossad action again? Does uh, Levi come back into play and cause some ruffles before the, the big wedding day? If there's a wedding day. You might see <laughs> Levi again. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. I think they're, uh, Levi, the ex, is um, you know somebody who might pop up. Yeah, there's definitely bumps along the way, but it is a, it is a, a real love story, I think, which is not something we do a lot of, and, and I think it's a really a good story. You know, Wrestler, he's got his, he's got his own uh, issues going on as well, and yes, there may be a lady or two or a love interest that uh, pass uh, through his storyline, um, or and, two, uh, I think he's got some, br- or two, hold on. Did I misspeak? Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, you maybe just said a, a lady or maybe two. Maybe a lady. Uh, you know, I, yeah, he's not out, you know, playing in the field. He's not like all of a sudden <laughs> hanging out at, at bars and, and, uh, you know, picking up the babes, but, uh, but we do have a good, we do have some, some, uh, some really good stories for wrestler too. And, and I think wrestler and Liz have, have a really interesting storyline this season that I think is, sort of people who like the early seasons where they were really teamed up. I think we, we sort of embrace that again. And Liz and wrestler are sort of thrown into it together where they're out sort of investigating more. And, and um, they, they have a, a really great storyline this season too. The Keenlers just like broke the internet, I think with that comment. <laughs> oh, no. They've been waiting for that, like for a long time. Well, there's a, there really is, it really is a great, a great story about the two of them and, Whatever their, I won't speak to it, but whatever their, the nature of their relationship is, there, there is clearly a, from, from being the guy who was super skeptical of her in the pilot to where they are now, it, it's a really cool arc. And, and um, I think it's going to play out in a way that I think fans are going to really like. And how about Cooper? Cooper's a character who we saw last season is willing to go beyond bend the law a little bit, if not break it. So what can we expect from, from Cooper? A little bit more of that? Are we going to see some shades of gray? What? You know, the Coop, uh, I, I <laughs> the love Coop. that guy. Harry is just, Harry is great. And he, he just has such a presence. You know, he just is, when he's pissed off and formidable, it's great. When he's the father figure, it's great. He's sort of the, I think he's sort of the angel on uh, one of Liz's shoulders and Red's probably the devil on the other. And yes, we have uh, uh, good stuff for Harry this year. Uh, again, you know, our cast, it's, 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 um, it's not a big cast. You know, we have a very small cast, in fact. Mm-hmm. So um, I think we have some really interesting, complex, emotional storylines, I, I, I think, for all of, our, uh, for all of our, our characters. So going back to a spoiler that you said, so if we skip ahead again about a minute or two, if you don't want to hear this. If he goes to jail, I'm assuming for Cooper that this causes a problem and I, a bigger problem for Maine Justice. So Panabaker, I'm assuming, is going to come back into play. Like, How does the task force continue to operate and does that jeopardize the task force being exposed, if you will? Uh-huh. That's the whole thing. That's, the fun of this is, skip ahead another 60 seconds if you're, <laughs> if you're just catching up to this, uh, 90 seconds. They can't acknowledge the relationship with Raymond Reddington. You know, yes, Panna Baker has a perspective on this, and it is not one that uh, she doesn't, isn't happy to deliver the news, and, and it is not one that Cooper wants to hear. But, the, but they can't acknowledge any kind of relationship. They can't acknowledge that this has happened. So it puts everyone in an incredibly awkward place where, where he's sort of, Spader, you know, Spader's character is left to fend for himself in a really dire way that we've not seen before. And, and again, it is, it comes, uh, comes uh, very, I, I, I hate to keep repeating the word organic, but it comes very organically from the story of the way this was all set up, what the relationship was in the beginning. And um, look, one day, if you get busted, that's, that's your problem. We can't come to help you. So what can they do? How can they circumvent the system? Can they circumvent the system to help him in any way? 
And and again, and then what do the various characters feel about that? Do maybe maybe some don't want to help them. Maybe some do. So it's a good story engine for us. And um, I, I wish it wasn't all over the promos, but it is uh, it is one that I think is is going to be really uh, fulfilling to watch un, un, unfold. And I fully expect Dembe to be parked outside the Maserati, outside the prison gates, uh, basically just waiting. That's my plan. Well, Mercedes. No, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the Maserati. So it's got to be Mercedes. But yes, Dembe, you know, is... We've talked about some storylines for Dembe, both with Hisham and just among ourselves, that we have yet to get to that could be really great. Uh, we have not penned them, and, and they're still sort of in the pipeline, but he's just such a great character he's a great presence he by saying so little he he just you just know and and he does actually have some some really interesting sort of moral positions to take uh this season and um yeah hisham's fantastic love that guy he is he's great you have all of this going on and yet nobody is looking at the wild card in the background as jennifer reddington is now Uh sitting there tag teaming with liz we got this whole other side of the story to explore. How much is Jennifer going to be involved in season six? Well, she's, uh, yeah, she is deeply involved. And, you know, Jennifer Reddington, just to break it down, just to recap, Jennifer and Liz, both the daughters of Raymond Reddington, Naomi Highland was the mother of Jennifer. Katerina Rostova was the mother of Liz. So different mothers, the same father, but that father was Raymond Reddington, who is not. James Spader. So, uh, yes, they have a very complicated family tree and two characters who had a very, had very different upbringings in our, in our storylines. Right. I mean, Liz was, she was uh, adopted and, and raised and in the law enforcement and sort of had this vision of who she wanted to be. And Jennifer has been on the run hiding. Her mother was murdered. And, and she, when we saw her last, uh, last season, not when we saw her last, but at the end of last season, she, she told Reddington off. She didn't want to ever see him again, and she was done. And yet she is sucked back into this thing, back into Reddington's orbit uh, by this reveal of the bones, and uh, it's going to be hard for her to walk away from this, and she is going to be useful to Liz in ways that are, are I hope, unexpected and very satisfying. I'm really excited about that arc and where it goes. One, the The biggest change for fans is that this year, you're all together. You're doing all the episodes back to back to back. It's basically January to, to May. You're just hitting the ground running. And you're not going to stop. Now, some fans were initially concerned about this. I'm not one of them because I remember when I believe it was 24 did it before Lost. When, it season four of 24, they started doing that where all the episodes lined up back. And obviously it's more, it's more of a serialized show, but it was still when you have a mythology heavy show, it's nice to get to the next episode and not have that two week, three week, four week break. How is it for you guys? Are you, are you, does it matter to you either way? Does it feel easier to tell the story in some ways or where do you, where do you land on this? Well, in in a way it was easier in that you're not staring at this September 23rd deadline, which is coming up very quickly. Right. Uh, You know, so just psychologically it feels like, ah, we got all the time in the world. But the truth is the post schedule stays exactly the same. The episodes are due at the same uh, rate by the time you get, Episode eight or nine episodes done, you're just desperately falling behind. Typically, when you start airing in the fall, and you know, uh, and then and then you fall behind again by the time you get to episode twenty two. And we will be woefully behind by the you know by the time our last episodes are airing. But the thing that is good about it, uh, aside from the you know how it, it's also allowed us to go back and sort of adjust storylines a little more. You know, versus oh my gosh, that story is locked. We went back and well, I'll give you an example. We went back and, and redid the teaser, which I think they've released now online. But our teaser, which is a bank robbery, uh, we had scripted an entirely different teaser, had waited to shoot it for a production reason, and decided, you know what, we need something different. And so we went back and we wrote this, and, um, and I think it's a really fun opening. And so we were able to have a little more control in that way. But in terms of the audience, which I think is all that really matters, but in terms of the audience and the way they consume the show, one, we have a, I've always had a very heavy DVD audience. You know, the live numbers obviously matter, but people watch our show, uh, you know, they record it, it's often on late, 
uh, and they watch it, you know, uh, when they want. And in that way, I think it doesn't really matter because people are going to go watch it when they, you know, when they want to watch it, they'll watch it. They'll DVR them and, and catch up. Uh, the other thing that's really cool about this season that I'm very excited about is, like you had mentioned, Aaron, there, I think we have one in the series of 22 episodes. I think we have one preemption where we're not on. I think maybe between episode six or seven, somewhere in there, we're off for a week. Other than that, we're on, it's not even we're on 22 weeks in a row. We have, I think, three, if not four, two-parters. So the first Friday night we're on, it's two episodes. I think, um, anyway, episode 14, 15, episode 20, 20 and 22, I'm, 20 and 21. I, I'm messing them up. The point is there's, there are a number of double episodes that you're going to be able to burn through them. So the idea of waiting for three weeks and trying to remember and watching a recap, that is out the window. And I think that's great for the audience. I'm really excited about it. I really am. Yeah, I mean, 24 did that perfectly. Yeah, it's, 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 it's exciting production-wise knowing that once we start, the race is on, the fuse is lit, and we just we, we go through them. It's, it's a little less important. We still, there's, you, I think you guys will find the, the we still have sort of the same arcs within the season. You still, you'll probably still feel the writing sort of working toward what would be maybe a midseason cliffhanger or resolution or a, a movement sort of, and then moving into new stories. But it's a race, and I think it's gonna, I think it's going to be a fun way to watch. Is there anything you want to tease people as we head out? No, I think, uh, no, I think, I think that, uh, look, I am thrilled with our cast. We've got big turns coming this season. Uh, we have, as I think we always do big reveals and, 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 and sort of a storytelling that is getting us closer to the, the truth. I mean, let's be honest, we're closer to, I believe the ending than the beginning and we are marching toward you know, we're still on that same path of, of moving toward a, a resolution to so many of these questions. And I, you know, and I, I feel good about the questions we've, we've answered, even though they raise many more questions. But <laughs> I think this season is, um, is both incredibly emotional and sort of dangerous in ways, and yet is an absolute blast. I, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about it and just still remind myself how lucky I am to be able to be working with these people day in and day out. And we, you know, uh, today we had uh, uh, a tone call where we were talking about episode 13 and I was like, guys, oh, can we really do all of this? Can we really shoot this? It's going to be a big episode. And, um, and they, everyone ponies up every time they, they, uh, they really deliver and we've got great cast. We've got great uh, turns. It's going to be a really fun season. Big guest stars. Any big guest stars you could mention or too soon? Um, we've got, uh, we got a couple. I don't, I don't, I don't think I, I'm at this point, I'm probably getting in trouble if I mention anybody, okay. but, uh, but yeah, we got some, we have, we have some, uh, even, uh, even the people who aren't like, Oh my God, that's the, you know, that uh, Mark Hamill's mm-hmm. in the show, by the way, Mark <laughs> Hamill's not in the show, but you know, the people who, whose name you would recognize <laughs> some of some great, great character actors and sort of New York stage actors and really, unusual uh, folks. So it's going to be a good season. Well, season six kicks off in the States, January 3rd, January 4th, two nights, two blacklisters. It's going to be epic. And if you miss it on Thursday night, you can watch obviously the premiere back to back on Friday, or like you said, DVR it when you can, but really people, this is the year to watch live. You've had all the time in the world to catch up on Netflix. And this is the year that we need to make sure that uh, the live numbers stay up. So we get season seven and it's just uh, great. Always uh, John, that you stop by, talk to us and the fans. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, absolute blast. Once again, can't wait for it to start. Thanks guys. Thanks for chatting about the show. Okay guys, I am letting you know, you should be excited because the blacklist is coming back. It's going to be on January 3rd and 4th. Yes. It's actually, it's a weird release schedule. It's going to air on the third, the first hour. And then on the fourth, it's going to repeat that first hour and then leads right into the second hour. Correct. Which I think is a, a great move by NBC because they're going to have that new game show uh, Titans on mm-hmm. for the two hours before the blacklist airs, which will be telling the blacklist is going to air Thursday at the 10 o'clock hour nine central before it moves to like its normal time spot of the nine o'clock eight central on Fridays. 
So it, it is a little weird to kick off the premiere, but I think it's good. People want to people want to enjoy a longer like update. You know, it's it's the well, and it's it's getting the Thursday viewers, the people that weren't really certain that Blacklist was not on Thursdays anymore. Now they're going to know. They can catch that first hour. They can come back the next night and catch the second hour. I actually think it's a really clever marketing strategy. They're like, they're like hey, it's like season two all over again, and then we're going to move it on you, just like we did in season three. I think I think Friday's going to lock for a while, which is cool because I can watch Blacklist and Hawaii Five O on the same night. I think it's a good combo too because they're going to pair it up with a Blind Spot. So I, the, the, those two shows together, FBI, you get a little Crime Time Friday kind of thing going. If it if it holds, it's <laughs> normal. Crime, did you say Crime Time Friday? Yeah. All right. If you look at their Wednesday numbers, if they were you know holding like a point nine in the ratings, if they do a point nine on Fridays, that's like cash cow for NBC. So. We'll have to see what the ratings look like. I'm pretty excited. Well, you know, it's a DVR show. A lot of people watch it after the fact, so we'll see what the ratings are. But I have no doubt the Blackest is going to kick some ass this year. You have a lot to look forward to. I, I think John has has kind of whetted the appetite a little bit. So get ready. Get get your popcorn. Get your fedora ready. Get out your little, your people that dress their dogs like red. Get all that ready. It's coming. The blacklist is coming. And you can hear us now on Pandora. In the States. Yes. In the United okay. States, we can do Pandora. Move to the States and you can hear us on Pandora. If you live anywhere else, apparently Pandora doesn't want to be there. Isn't it like an international? It's worldwide, isn't it? Just the, uh, It's a small rollout. Uh, we got hand selected as, a, as an award winning podcast, I guess, to be in the first batch for <laughs> Pandora. So yay for us. Yay for you guys. That way, if you like your music and you like listening to it, and you can just you know also add the blacklist to your collection, good stuff. Unless you happen to be in the Lost Colonies land, because uh, you guys don't get Pandora. No, that's the UK because you guys lost us. But those guys, those guys can get us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify. Uh, so that's uh, all kinds of different ways. And of course, you can always listen from the website, which is always good. So the way I'm understanding that Spotify is global and Pandora not yet. That's at least for podcasts. Fight, fight, fight. <laughs> All right. Well, I think it's going to do it. I am tired, mostly. But I am also ready to get back into the podcast world with the Blacklist Exposed. And I think we can probably head out. Do we tease that uh, what might be happening for our premiere episode? Is you we- know what? We could probably tease what might be happening on our premiere episode. We're going to have our inaugural Blacklist podcast. We are going to discuss both episodes on one podcast. And those episodes are... Dr. Hans Kohler and the Corsicant. And once we get to the end of our podcast, we will also have a little revisit from John Bokenkamp, who's going to explain some of the things we saw. Oh, so he's mm. like kind of teased us now, and then he's going to like, hey, here's what I really meant. <laughs> exactly. He can he can dive into it a little deeper, some of, some of the things, once that actually premieres. So you got that to look forward to. Don't think you're done with John. You got a little bit more John coming in the next podcast. So get ready. We're going to have an exciting year. And don't forget, you can also tweet along with us if you want, when we can, because it is Friday night. There are some obligations with family and such. But at the Blacklist GSM, that's at the Blacklist GSM on Twitter. And of course, join our Facebook group. You can go to facebook.com slash groups slash the blacklist GSM. Also got a YouTube channel. So if uh, YouTube is your thing, you can go ahead and, you know, for the people that can't listen on Pandora, you got YouTube as an option. So go to the YouTube channel and check out the podcast there. And of course, we'll be back up on Tumblr and Instagram and a whole bunch of other places. And don't forget profiling question of the week. What do you want to see in season six? With that, we will be back in a week. Talk to you then. Bye bye. Take care. Until next time, I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. That's at Troy Heinrichs on Twitter. And if you want to learn more about me, just visit, well, about.me slash Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson. You can hear me talking about movies and TV on the Hollywood Outsider podcast, as well as remake this movie right. We are available at thehollywoodoutsider.com or on Twitter at H underscore Outsider. Be sure to subscribe, download the app, submit your feedback, but most importantly, keep yourself off of The The Blacklist. The Blacklist Exposed is a Golden Spiral Media production. Find more of our great podcasts at goldenspiralmedia.com slash podcasts.